you know, immigration or migration in some ways is sort of the story of human history, right? Mm -hmm. yes. It is in that sense, it's one of the most universal stories that humankind knows and tells itself. <laughs> Welcome to our latest episode of Book Reporter Talks To, where our guest today is Thridi Amgar, and we are going to be talking about the Museum of Failures, which is a Book Reporter Bets On selection, just as her last book, Honor, was, and that was also a Reese pick. Our Book Reporter reviewer, Catherine Weissman, had this to say about the book. The Museum of Failures is instructive as well as moving, as she captures the anguish of people torn between two worlds. Her own writing takes on a cinematic brilliance, evoking the imperfect earth of the city that Remy once loved and then left. It's a poignant journey with an, earning, an ending that's better than Remy could have imagined or dreamed of, though different from what he expected. So that's what we're saying about the book. Welcome, Brittany. It's so great to see you again. Well, wonderful to be here, Carol. And thank you for this wonderful review. That means a great deal to me. We're, we were really excited. Catherine really enjoyed the book. So can you give us a little overview, just your you know, pitch about the Museum of Failures, how you would uh, share it with us? Sure. So it basically tells a fairly simple story about a very successful Indian American businessman from Columbus, Ohio. He owns his own business. He has a very happy marriage to an American woman. Um, and when the novel opens, he returns to India, which is uh, to the city of Bombay in India, where he was born and raised. And uh, the, the reason for the visit is to adopt a child that somebody that he knows is a teenage mom is giving up for adoption. Um, but he still has, his mom still lives in India. And we find out very quickly that he has a very conflicted mm -hmm. uh, relationship with his mother. He always has. He's more or less in touch with her, but for the most part, they are estranged. Mm -hmm. um, father has died, uh, his beloved father has died three years uh, earlier. Um, so he goes to visit his mom while he's there, obviously, and finds out that she's actually in the hospital. So the story sort of makes one of several turns in that it now becomes a story of, rather than him becoming a father, which is still uh, in the works, you know, now he has to step up to being the son that he actually has never been to his mother. So he nurses her back to health. And when he finally brings her home, he stumbles upon a family secret, which yet again um, makes Remy Wadia, that's his name. Uh, it makes Remy um, really sort of rethink everything that he's held to be uh, true and dear. Um, and reevaluate huge uh, sections of his life. Mm -hmm. I would say that's what the book is about. Exactly. And it's, you know, you see Remy come home as one person and leave as somebody else because yes. of what happens in the middle. And it's absolutely fascinating to see his development as a person besides what you're seeing with the other characters, you know, throughout the book. Every book's got this moment of inspiration, sometimes more than one. Was there one that was really the catalyst for this book? Very much so, actually. And it was another work of art. It was a movie. I think it came out in 2019 called The Farewell. And in, in some strange way, it is also a movie about immigration. It, it stars this Chinese-American uh, woman who goes back to China to visit her mom. And there's a very devastating scene at the end of the movie where she and her parents are saying goodbye to the old lady pretty much sure that they'll never see her again. You know, the grandmother lives in China and they are leaving for the airport. And um, man, there was just something about that scene that it was like a dagger through my heart. And of course it's because I'm an immigrant and I've had family that I've had to leave behind in mm -hmm. India. And it just resonated with me. And I walked out of the theater. I remember walking out of this darkened theater, must have gone to an earlier show because it was still light outside and sort of blinking in the sunlight. And right then and there, I thought this feeling that I'm feeling, um, it has to find expression in some form. And I had no idea what form, what you know form or shape that would take at that moment. I didn't have a character. I didn't have a plot. 
but I carried that feeling out of the theater with me. And a couple of years later, I think it took shape as this book. Wow. So along the way, if you walked out of the theater, did you take any notes of your emotion or was the emotion so much in you from there? Yeah. You didn't have to do that. You I didn't... don't need to take notes of my emotions. That I one. carried them within me. So, yeah. Yeah. No. And I knew And uh, just one more thing about that moment, you know, so this was 2019 and we all know the whole Mm -hmm. debate about illegal immigration mm -hmm. that had really gripped the country, you know, building the wall, uh, all of that. And so that was also very much on my mind, right? And when I finally conceived the character of Remy, who's this wildly successful, you know, well-to-do, educated guy, right, who has come to this country with all the privileges one can imagine, right? Um, I just thought if Remy himself still feels this tug within himself, if he still has the sense of uh, divided self, you know, mm -hmm. what would it be like for people who cross the border with nothing but the clothes on their backs mm -hmm. and perhaps have no opportunity to ever return home? You know, mm -hmm. no, no economic opportunities to go home. Who knows what the state of their families, what world they have left behind, right? So that was something very important to me too, to, to talk about, you know, the only form of immigration that I know, which is legal immigration, but hoping against hope that somebody reading this book, it would soften their hearts a little bit so that maybe they could extrapolate from that and understand what a genuinely weighty, you know, Immigration or migration in some ways is sort of the story of human history, right? Mm -hmm. yes. It is in that sense, it's one of the most universal stories that humankind knows and tells itself. And yet it is also so deeply singular and personal, mm -hmm. you know, True. it's it's unique to every person who has left home behind, mm -hmm. right? And I'm always fascinated with these notions of what is home? You know, what is it? Is it just the people? Is it is it the land? Like, uh, I love thinking about those things. So some of all of that makes it into the into this book. And, you know, it's very interesting because um, our, our housekeeper, her son's wife is still in Guatemala. He is an American citizen. She is waiting to come. She has done all the paperwork. They have a baby. She cannot come because most of the people coming in right now are from Venezuela and from Ukraine. And that is the priority of bringing people in and every other thing is back burnered. And it's very interesting to hear everything has been filed. The lawyers have done everything they're supposed to do, yeah. but now we've got two other global crises and that's where our attention is. And it's just fascinating and, to hear about it, you know? And it's not just because of that. It's not even in normal times. I mean, the weights, you know, so all these people who say, I have no problem with people coming into this country legally. You know, mm -hmm. I just don't want anybody sneaking in. Right. They don't know what they're talking yes. about, Carol. Right, right. Because weights for legal immigration are, there's such a backlog that most people will like give up before it actually happens, you know? Yeah. So, so it's just a little compassion. I mean, I understand that this is a complicated dilemma that we face as a nation, mm -hmm. but I can't help but think that just a little compassion would go a long ways. Right. And we're also thinking about two countries that are being taken care of. Is there a better way to do this so it's more equal of what's coming in, the people who are coming in, not what's people who are coming in? I don't know. The title of the book comes out through, comes up throughout the book. And I love that because I'm always looking for, oh, where's the kernel of the title? First of all, there was a real museum of failures in Sweden. So how did you come across this? I just came across an article. I don't remember if it was in the Times or something, but this was years and years ago. It was a delightful article about this museum that at that time uh, still existed. It has since closed, which is itself a kind of delicious irony that I really <laughs> relish, you know. Um, but uh, it was apparently a brick and mortar store or museum that that had like failed uh, inventions failed products, you know, um, and of course the assumption being that one, I'm, I'm assuming this was the assumption that one learns as much from failure as one does from success, right? right? But I just read, and it's the actual museum was called the Museum of Failure, you know, singular. Mm -hmm. uh, my book is Failures. Right. Um, 
But I read that and I immediately thought, that's it. That's going, someday I'm going to write a book with this title. It was just irresistible. And then for three or four years, I would look around thinking, God, I hope no other writer came across <laughs> the same article and had the same thought process, you know? So luckily for me, I think I beat the rest of the pack to the punch. So, um, and I, so when I conceived of Remy and his, really his love-hate relationship with the city of his birth, Bombay, I just thought it acted as a beautiful metaphor for how yeah. we felt about the city. I hope New Coke was in that museum. <laughs> Talk <laughs> about a failure. And you know, it's one of those ones that marketers always refer to as, is this good or is it New Coke? You know, is this good? It, is is it, it do whatever? Exactly. Yeah, you know? exactly. So there's a chance for Remy and his wife, Kathy, to adopt a Parsi baby. And what is very special about this is it's a smaller group. And I believe you're part of your heritage is part Farsi as well. Yes. So tell us a little bit about that and why this is such a small population of people. I think I saw a hundred thousand. Am I right? That might be an optimistic uh, count at this point. Um, I mean, the latest figures I've seen put it anywhere between 40,000 uh, and a and hundred thousand. Um, so uh, Parsis are practitioners of an ancient uh, faith called Zoroastrianism, which originated in the Middle East. In fact, a lot of religious scholars would believe, would tell you that the three major religions that we know now that came out of that region all have their origins in, in Zoroastrianism. Mm. Uh, it was the state religion of the Persian Empire, which at one point, you know, was the biggest, largest empire in the world. Um, this is all, you know, millennia back, right? What we are mm -hmm. talking about. But about a thousand years ago, my ancestors um, came from Persia to India, um, from mostly what we would today call Iran, right? So, so before before when the Arab conquests of of Iran or Persia occurred. Uh, many of them converted to Islam, the local people, but some refused to. And a handful of those people basically came by boat, by ships to the western shores of India and, and requested uh, asylum. You know, that's how we would refer to them today. And there's a beautiful legend about that encounter with the local Hindu king, which I actually wrote a children's picture book about called mm -hmm. Sugar and Milk that retells and recasts uh, that story. It's a lovely story. I won't bore you with it at the moment, but basically the Hindu king uh, allowed them in and there was a promise made by this leader of this uh, expedition. He was a priest um, who basically said, if you let us in, not only will we live among you in peace, but we will actually sweeten the lives of the people around us. And that promise of sweetening the life of people around you was something that the Parsis have really, really lived up to. Hmm. Um, you know, Freddie Mercury, uh, of Queen was, yes. was a Zoroastrian, uh, Zubin Mehta, uh, Homi Baba. I mean, all these names that that we that are kind of household names. Mm -hmm. uh, Royton Mystery, the novelist, right? So it's a very very small community, but it has really been fundamental, I would say, to the building of modern India. Hmm. Certainly, the uh, the city of Bombay itself. You know, one of the questions I was going to be talking to you about is how much um, Remy is surprised that people in the United States don't know anything about these world cultures and the way our geography is taught and the way the world is taught is so completely different. And he is surprised that there's no knowledge of things that he's talking about that he thinks should be known on a greater scale. When my younger son was in um, eighth grade, he had a fabulous, fabulous um, teacher. And she said, put the book down. We're not going to do the book. If we do the book, we'll get up to World War II. And a lot has happened since then. And he did brilliantly in her class, except for the one quarter that she was out for replacement hip surgery. And she says, I don't know what happened to Corey. She said, but I wasn't there. And he goes, oh, the other stuff was so boring. We had to do the textbook. She says, we'll do some extra credit. But she really gave them a world view. And we realized that we are so U.S. centric 
of what's going on. And it's only what's happening to us. It's not what's happening in a part of the world that may have nothing to do with us. And Remy brings up at one point that he's so surprised that that's what happens in America. And I shake it, you see the same thing because it's a, this is all we know. Well, I mean, when I was a teenager in India, we used to joke. Now, this is me growing up in the 70s, you know, when Star Wars and all that was huge, right? Um, we used to go around. We were smart, Alex, you know, a bunch of us. And we would go around saying, yeah, Americans know more about outer space than they know about other countries. Mm -hmm. And I wish I could say that after I came here, I realized I was totally wrong and it was a bad joke <laughs> to make. But uh, if anything, uh, I realized just that, you know, you know what generation that I used to encounter when I first came here in the early 80s that knew a lot about geography? It was men who had served in World War II. Interesting, right. Because they were posted, they were based in bases all around the world. You know, they would talk to me about Burma and, you know, places that I'd never been to, but they knew a little something about geography. But but like people, and I came here to go to grad school, right? So these were people supposedly with an education, my, my classmates, not a clue, not a clue. But I also thought understanding about each other's religions, usually around 13, people are bar mitzvah, they're confirmed, if they're in the Christian faith, I don't know what happens in other faiths, but I said, what if we spent the year they were 14 going to the other churches, going to the other places of worship and getting to see what that was like and see what those religions were and how they practiced. And I said, it's not a hard thing to do, but to make that, like, let's look at curriculum. That's the 14 yeah. year, like, you know, yeah. thing to do. And you do it with there's six things you go do or something. And I just think that, I think I thought about that like after 9-11, because there was a fabulous a seminar that um, Abraham was the same in all three religions in right. Islamic. Right. And we went one night and Jane Friedman from Harper Collins had organized an evening with an Iman um, minister and a priest. And it was a fascinating evening. And it's one of those things you don't forget because you were taken outside of your comfort zone. You yes. were in. Yes. And yes. thinking much more broadly at the end of the yeah. evening. And I feel like yeah. more of that happening, even hearing about people across the border, hearing about, you know, what happens. My son had gone to Mexico on business and it was very fraught with you're going with a guard, you're going with this and that. And he says, you learn a lot when you go to these places and you see what's going on. Right. And he says, when you're firsthand, you have a different take than yeah. 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 reading, just yeah. doing this. Yeah. I think if there was enough wealth in this country, I think every U.S. citizen should should be asked or offered help to travel because mm -hmm. there is no better ambassador for global understanding than than travel. You right, know? right, and this is what's going to happen. Eight people. It's interesting you said we are veering away, but we'll come know, back. We'll come back. We about, always yeah. do. <laughs> you know, I'm teaching one of the classes I'm teaching this semester is about the literary response to 9-11. Mm -hmm. And the first book that I start with is called The 9-11 Report, which mm -hmm. is just a graphic novel um, yep. version of the actual, you know, the 9-11 Commission report. Um, there's a line in that towards the end, one panel that says, in the end, they understood us better than we understood them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? This is like the narrative voice. So it must be part of the findings that mm -hmm. that how did nine they knew all the fault lines, mm -hmm. just like in the 2020, uh, sorry, 2016 election with the Russian uh, disinformation and all that. They knew the fault lines of race. Mm -hmm. Right. So that's where they went. Right. So. This is the this is the price that one pays for not thinking of oneself. And when I say one, I mean nationwide as part of a planet. Mm -hmm. you know, we we are so used to thinking of ourselves as a country that we sometimes forget that we belong to the same planet. Look at climate change. Right. You know? Right. It's not, you know, the climate is not going to say, oh, Bangladesh had nothing to do right. with carbon emissions so let's spare bunk. no it's going to affect all of us it yes. is affecting all of us i mean carol you know i keep reading these surveys that say that believe it or not cleveland ohio is one of the safest places to be because of because we have a great lake so we have an endless supply of fresh water 
And we have been immune to tornadoes and earthquakes and, you know, all, all those things. Well, guess what? We couldn't go out for at least two weeks this summer because of the smoke from the Canadian wildfires. Right, right, right. right. Yes. No one is immune to no. what is happening, you know? No, and I remember that night I was in New York. I went in for an event. And I rarely go into the city, but it was the 100th anniversary of Norton. So I went in and you were just driving. And the interesting thing was there were a lot of tourists there just walking around. And I was like, do you understand this is like really bad right now? This is not what you should be breathing. And the way the whole place turned yellow in the afternoon. But it's interesting because, yes, there are all kinds of issues and everybody ticks off a box, makes a donation, makes a this and that. But Owning like what happens in the world, opening what opening your eyes, which is what I think you really do with your books, is give us this view. And I'm going to talk about some of the scenes in it. That there was one particular one that I just was smiling at at the same time. But coming back, let's go here. That Remy's mother is 70, and that doesn't feel old here in the United States. Oof. Is the lifespan shorter in India? Because I'm like, whoa, 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 70, whoa, whoa, whoa. You know? Yeah, yeah. Um... So that was interesting. And to be honest with you, I struggled with that a lot. I wanted to make her a lot older, but I didn't know how to do that without making Remy older. Right. And because Remy is there to adopt a child, you know, he kind of had to be in his 30s somewhere, okay. right? So so part of that is just, I was constrained by the dictates of the plot, so to speak. Um so, of course, the life expectancy amongst Indians is much lower than it is over here. It's a poorer country. Uh, but the Parsis, for reasons I don't understand, and I don't think anybody understands, have ridiculously high life expectancies. I mean, Parsis routinely live into their 90s, routinely, right? So, so that's right. It's because when the doctor says, you know, your mom is an elderly person and Remy's like, what nonsense? She's not that old. <laughs> He's speaking not just as an American, but presumably because he also knows that, you know, most Parsis, 70 is like, they're like spring chickens at that age. And Parsis have the most horrific uh, diets you can imagine, right? Everything has to be topped uh, with an egg. Um, yes. <laughs> animal fat, you know, every, you can't eat a vegetable unless I'm not like that, but most of them are, you can't eat a vegetable unless it has meat in it of some kind. Right. right. So everything that a cardiologist would tell you not to do, Parsis do, and they outlive everyone else. Yeah. Well, so, it was really interesting because I was listening to the meals that they were making and I was like, whoa, whoa, yeah. cholesterol die. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Food. Yeah. 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 And it was it was interesting because we you are reading about the foods throughout. You know, Remy has asked some family members to watch over his mother in exchange for their getting an apartment in a good neighborhood that they probably could not afford. And he arrives at the realize they've abused this privilege that he has, you know, put on their shoulders and not given his mother the care they need. And she's been just as tough with them, though, as she is with him. And she's a very difficult woman. This is not somebody. And is their role like really to point out how difficult his mother is? I felt like their role in the book at this point is like, it's not just you. She's like this with everyone. And then he has to have some come to like, you know, figure out what I'm going to do because I'm going to leave her in their hands. She's either got to change or I've got to like, you know, maybe give them something else to try to sweeten the right. deal or stay more on top of them. Am I right there? Because she, we're seeing she's just a difficult person. So I don't think uh, that Remy necessarily needs his cousin to point out to him how yeah. difficult his mother is. I mean, he's seen her in action, not just with him, but the way she used to um, interact with his father. Um, you know, she's routinely fired servants. I mean, she has the reputation in the community of being a difficult person. Um, he has, in fact, told his cousins this, you know, when he's making the arrangements with them for her care while he's away. Um, but he feels a sense of betrayal because he feels as if he has given them ample notice and warning about what they're dealing with and who they're dealing with. But despite all that, you know, what he has promised them in return uh, is so huge. Mm -hmm. I mean, really, you know, Bombay is like Manhattan, uh, housing prices are off the charts, right? 
and in a neighborhood like Breach Candy, um, they would never have been able to afford that on their own. So he still expects something back in, in exchange for this. And, and when he realizes that they have treated her very dismissively because they are human and they don't like the way she has dealt with them. He's angry at them. And then he's angry at himself because that, um, you know, that, that guilt um, mm. sort of uh, arises in him. And he thinks, well, what did I expect? I've sort of passed on my responsibilities, my obligations as a son uh, to really virtual strangers. I mean, he's, it's his cousin, but they have not been close, you know? Right. So so it's this combination of resentment at them, but also feeling a sense of guilt. Right. It's like, it, can you just call me when she's in the hospital? Like, don't call me when she yells at you, but how about when she goes to the hospital? Why don't we give a list of things? I feel like right. he's at the point where, well, what has to happen? Does she die before you say something to me? Right. Like, exactly. why was I not told? So, yeah. You know, early in the book, Cyrus, Remy's dad says, you only have two jobs in life to be happy and make others happy. And let's talk about that because it says so much about his father that he wanted a perfect life. He wanted everything to be just shiny and perfect and wonderful and them to be perceived that way as well. Even with his wife, you know, to be perceived like that. So I think it's just so much to be happy and make others happy. Great line. Yeah, yeah, I think especially for his son, I mean, Cyrus is madly in love with his son, mm -hmm. right? And and he is willing to do anything and pay any price himself to ensure his son's happiness, including um, from behind the scenes, sort of almost um, manipulating things so that Remy uh, feels like he's programmed to leave, mm -hmm. you know, he's programmed to leave India and build a life for himself. Um, Cyrus encourages his decision to get out of India, and he also encourages and supports his decision to stay once he meets Kathy and wants to marry her. Mm -hmm. uh, Shirin, of course, the mother, feels exactly the opposite. She wants her son with her to be back home. Um, there's a line in the book that says something like, you know, this is the father, Cyrus, talking, saying, I never raised you to be a pigeon-chested Indian boy. I raised you to be a confident, you know, um, American boy. Mm -hmm. um, and and that's, to me, that's pretty radical, you know, mm -hmm. that that he was thinking of his, you know, where would, what would be the best place for his son? Uh, and he's willing to sacrifice his own happiness uh, mm -hmm. for the sake of his son. Yeah. And it's even like, there's one day where he says, his mother's clearly distraught. And when you hear the other things that are going on, you realize all the things she could be destroyed. And he says, let's go to the zoo. What would you like to do today? I want to go to the zoo. I want to go see the elephants. My friend told me the elephants spewed water and it's a fabulous day. And his father brings him back and it's like, oh, it's just to be happy, just to be everything going on in life. And I just think it's a wonderful attitude to have, but at what cost? At what yeah. cost in the in the big scheme of things? Because he becomes the hero while the mother becomes the villain just about every single step of the way. So- right. So then Remy finds this letter for his dad that was meant for him and he doesn't understand it when he sees it. Did you always want the family secret to be divulged on this note that he quite kind of doesn't understand? Like there has to be a way because his father's gone to learn this family secret. And I feel like this cryptic kind of a thing that you may come across, was that always how you were going to present? Like what, what's going on here really? Yeah, I just, that was just a bit of foreshadowing, if you will. I just wanted people to know that at, I wanted people, frankly, to keep reading, you know, mm -hmm. and, and the initial chapters almost by definition were kind of a little slow because all it is is Remy spending time with the would-be mother of the child that he hopes to adopt and sitting endless hours in the hospital trying to interact with a woman who has um, fallen silent, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So, um I needed there to be some mystery, some sense of drama uh, with that note. And and if a reader was, you know, paying attention, I think their attention would snag on that and say, what's that about? And I hope I find out what that note was meant to say as time goes by and keep reading. Because ultimately, this is what I say to my writing students, right? Ultimately, you have one job. You want the reader to turn the page. 
Yes. Keep reading. Keep reading. Keep going, keep reading. folks. That's yeah. what you need to do. Keep reading. I agree. So you see that. So you've got this little clue. And he has this line also. There's no room for hope in the Museum of Failures. The Museum of Failures comes up so many times. Even if it hangs on the wall for a moment, it usually comes crashing down. And I just love that. Like hope can't really exist when you start constantly thinking about failure. You have to just sit there and say, things are going to go wrong. Nothing is going to go right. Well, see, so Remy is definitely jaundiced um, about the city of his birth and its projection is what it is. I mean, it's mostly because of his lifelong conflict with his mom, conflict that he simply doesn't understand. He's carrying a lot of pain and a lot of hurt from Sharon's treatment of him from the time he was pretty young, you know, and that has colored um, his entire view of his childhood and consequently the city in which he spent that childhood, you know. So I would caution you, I would just say, take everything that Remy says in, in the early chapters of the book with a pinch of salt. That's exactly, exactly. And But he's also, a, the, it segues right into this, crowded streets are so common in India. And I love the image of the family of five on one motorcycle that oh, you did, yeah. where one child is standing in front of his father, the two children riding pillions squished in front of their mother. And imagery like that, I feel gives your story so much depth. Because you can sit there and say the street is crowded. But when you realize an image like this of the family perched on the one motorcycle, you've done something like that to give us a little snapshot of what's really happening on the street yeah. right then. It's interesting. You call it imagery and I call it description. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it, it. I mean, you see that a lot in Bombay. You see entire families on, on these little, sometimes on scooters, you know, just those two wheel uh, scooters. Um, um, because that's all they can afford. You right. know? They can't afford to buy a car. Yeah, I just thought it was something that it just, you, you can talk about it's crowded. You can talk about, you know, what's happening. But when you do that, when you talk about the people walking down the street and he stops and there's somebody and they, they say, oh, I, your mom helped me somewhere along or your dad helped me somewhere along the way. You realize as big as it is, there's also this, you know, personal thing that's going back and forth where many people are still interacting with one another. It's not like this whole city where, it's just people walking around. No, right. no, no. There, right. there are many, many relationships. Oh. I feel like you do a great job of setting up the big and the small at the same time. We see the vastness, but how people really do connect. And and that really is that big and small is a great description of the city of Bombay itself. You know, for being, uh, I mean, I have throughout my life here compared uh, Bombay to New York, to Manhattan mm -hmm. specifically. There's, I, I won't go into all of that, but there's, a lot of, you know, they're both small islands that are really overcrowded with people. And, you know, there's that big city vibe to both places, all of that. I think one major difference, though, is Bombay in some ways still feels small mm -hmm. and, and connected and intimate in ways mm -hmm. that other big cities perhaps don't. And what I mean by that is, you know, let's say you're in a fender bender in Bombay. By the time you finish blinking, there'll be a crowd of minimum 30 people around you. And right. they're not just standing there to gawk. If you need help, they'll help you. Wow. You know, that sense of, I don't know what to call it, community, or yeah. it's just, it's just a very matter of fact thing that people in Bombay do. And, you know, as somebody who grew up wealthy, uh, wealthy, middle-class, let's just say, in that city, this is one of the reasons I personally can never give up on that city because mm -hmm. I see that kind of sweetness uh, amongst the common people, you know, amongst people who may not have two cents to rub together, but that graciousness, that, that willingness to help, you know, during the monsoons, when the city streets get flooded, mm -hmm. um, people will rescue each other out of stranded trains, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah, whereas here it's like on the news and it's those people, not me. That's them, not me. It's yeah. You yeah. Might, maybe you picture yourself, but not really. You know, it's on the flip side of the thing, Remy thinks of his wife and he realizes meeting her had been rich and deep and transforming. And watching him re-enter India, back to Bombay, he realizes how different their lives are. And so he's really like this dual person. Her family is warm and embraces him. 
His mother is cold and his father's gone. And the first half, he feels like an orphan. I feel like he feels like an orphan, whereas he realizes if he went back there, he'd be part of a big family. Is that a wrong thing to feel like he's like an orphan trying to help this woman that he's so estranged from that he has an obligation to? Yeah, no, I think that's actually um, a very good reading of the text. Um, I, I think I hadn't thought of it, to be honest with you, but I think, yeah, Remy does feel orphan because for all practical purposes, you know, he's he's a little afraid of his mom. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. The reason he warms up to her in the hospital is because she has mysteriously stopped communicating with people. She has literally stopped speaking and 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 she's she's lost a lot of weight. Uh, she's vulnerable now. He's no longer he doesn't she's powerless. You know, she no longer has the power to hurt him. Right. And I think this is all just early childhood stuff that he's mm -hmm. still holding on to. And once he realizes, you know, once the fear is gone, there's a vacuum there mm -hmm. and he can fill that vacuum with love. Mm -hmm. Right. The love has always been present. It's been present with both of them. You know, as we find out, Sharon loves him madly yes. and he, too, loves his mother. But he cannot express that love because the fear is too great. You know, she can be so cutting and so dismissive with him that he guards himself against her. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's and he's reluctant, though, also to take up some of the traditions now that are expected when you're there, including his mother's maid to perform simple household chores for him. He doesn't want that to be happening. He's surprised at how Americanized he's become and, you know, what's going on. And he has a lot of guilt and he's think he's surprised at how much has changed. And that's when I was thinking about your book, The Space Between Us, which I still think about. And I feel like living without this constant household support has influenced him more than he realizes when he sits down there. And I was thinking of the space between us of the way that there was definitely a hierarchy. She had a, the woman had um, a maid or the, the housekeeper had a special cup. She couldn't sit on the same level with the other woman. It was such a fascinating book, but I feel like he right now is almost seeing the, a woman as being equal to him because at home, he would never allow someone to take his shirts like she's doing and wipe every cup as he drinks it. You know? Right. Right. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, he's very Americanized and he finds these these traditions absolutely appalling, which is exactly what they are. You know, he's, he thinks of himself as this young, able bodied guy. He sees no reason on earth why he cannot pick up his dirty plate and take it to the sink. Um, right. Why someone has to do that for him. Right. Yeah. Somebody's so. got to do this stuff all along the way. And, you know, Remy's got two different views, two different remembrance of his mom. The first one is he remembers as a child watching the sun go down and his mother sues him by saying it'll be back the next day. And he realizes then this great line that sorrow is in proportion to the happiness he felt earlier. Sadness equals if I'm this happy, I've got to be this sad later. You can only miss what you value. There's so many great lines in this book, everybody. I was literally doing this as I was going. I feel like that's one of the big themes in this book is you can only miss what you value. And it's like, was something that I thought, did you give a lot of thought to that? Because where he's going is he's missing Bombay. So he has this feeling for it. He's missing his mom in a lot of ways. So it's price that feeling positive or negative. It's feeling that comes out. Yeah. I mean, I, I do believe I stand by that line. I, I think, uh, you know, loss and love, almost go hand in hand. I mean, you're not going to mourn uh, the loss of something that you didn't treasure and value in the first place. It seems to me, I mean, it doesn't even feel like a, it feels very obvious. I mean, I feel like that's uh, a fact. Mm -hmm. But the way you express it there, the way from, he's seeing it from a child's point of view, right. I just was, was, you know, just so brilliant. And then the book is divided into book one and book two. There's like this dividing line that comes in. You're like, why book two now? What's going to happen? And then you start to realize that the blinders are coming off for Remy. He's going to start to understand more. Was it always going to be a book one and a book two? Or as the editing process happened, did that end up, you know, saying there's a the line? I don't remember. I don't remember. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I'm, I'm guessing it was probably just in the writing of it. You mm -hmm. know, I don't outline my books, Carol. So uh, I don't. I just yeah. write you know, chapter by chapter. Sometimes if I'm very impatient, I'll write the ending first and then, you know, go back to chapter 12 uh, just to get 
it out of my system if mm -hmm. I if I know the shape of the book then I might do that but um but I have there's a pretty you know once uh Sharon leaves the hospital uh you sort of stop and then you take you inhale again and then you exhale and that becomes a whole new chapter mm -hmm. uh, and a whole new sort of passage in the book things change uh, when when he finally succeeds in bringing her home. So it just felt like a good point to just everybody settle in, take a breath. Here we start again. You yeah. Know? Here we start again with the other side of the story, the other yeah. side of what's going yeah. on. Yeah. And we don't want to give anything away. Did you always know what the reveal was going to be? Did you always I, know? I mean, pretty pretty much. I, I, I knew something had to happen. And initially I had, you know, just some very pedestrian uh, ideas Mm -hmm. um uh which which for for a minute there i thought yeah that would be strong enough and then i realized no because what i was thinking of was so commonplace that it wouldn't have had the power to sort of rock remy's world right and, and i needed i needed somebody to slap him and say wake up you know think um and and so it had to be a bigger thing than that yeah yeah, and sorry, yeah. you're both both of us are talking around it, and I appreciate you not giving anything. No, I don't want to give anything away. You know, Remy's mother would pinch him when he did something he didn't like. And this was very interesting. And at one point, as a child, he drops a butter dish on the ground and she whisks him away and he says, Pinch, mommy, pinch, because he's so used to this being the behavior. And he realizes she's she now realizes she's done that in the past. It's a big wake up and how he viewed it. And I feel like this moment between them makes them realize she needs a new way to interact with her son. She's got to do something else, whether she can or cannot. And I feel like the intent there was, oh my gosh, this is what I've done to this child all along. And now he feels that's a reflective behavior I should do on him, you know? And I thought it was it, like, right that you crystallize, ooh, look what's going on with those two. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, I agree with you. I think that's an important scene. Um, where Shirin for the first time really sort of gets hit between the eyes and realizes what what she has inflicted on mm -hmm. and how she has already shaped his personality. You know, he, she's made him like this rather nervous, timid boy um, because of how volatile she is and how unpredictable mm -hmm. her behavior is. I mean, I don't think Remy ever truly, even as an adult, doubts his mother's love for him but it's that um you know they say that that's the worst kind of abusive behavior right when it's pull and pull uh, and push um and i think uh i think sharon that is a wake up call for her and she yeah. never does it again after mm -mm. That. no that's 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 the she realizes that's an expected thing can that's the wrong thing to do it's just wrong mm -hmm. so little is talked about kathy the wife who's back in the states and we only hear from her from conversations with Remy. Was there ever a thought to have sections about her sharing stories of Remy with her family and friends in the state or to develop her more? Or because she's this character kind of off screen the whole way. If it was a film, maybe we see her. Maybe he's just on the phone with her. Right. Was there any, because it would be a much longer book, of course, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And not just a longer book, but it would take away, it would be a gigantic detour. Uh you know, for me, when I write, I, I literally say to myself, okay, what is the value added of mm -hmm. this particular scene? Mm -hmm. You know, like if, if the main plot is is the spine and everything else, I guess, are the ribs, you know, do we need that extra rib? Like, mm -hmm. like what, what would it add? How does it strengthen the spine to have, sorry, I need to get away from this metaphor. No, 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 but it's one more, it's working, it's working. <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, and I, I, I can't think of anything really that Kathy would have brought to that. I mean, what we need to know about Kathy is there in the book. You know, mm -hmm. Remy loves her very much. He's very happy with her. She has given him the stability and confidence that he has never had mm -hmm. growing up. Um, you know, and 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 in the end, she too has a change of heart to some extent. Yes. Um, the previous version of the book that I had read had Remy uh, have they Kathy and he have a child so the adoption thing was not there at all and um, that book ended with Kathy uh, saying she and the daughter 
were getting on a plane to come see Remy in India. Uh -huh. So it was it was very different. You very know? different story, but, yeah. Yeah, but in this version, I didn't really see a great need to have Kathy there. I wanted this to be a book about uh, a son and his mother. Mm -hmm. And there's also Remy pondering that he and Kathy were open to adopting a black child, but she wanted to have someone who looked like him in India, which was a very interesting for her to feel. And he does wonder if a white child was readily available. There are a lot of issues here to think about. What would they have done? Like if they could have just done this. And I feel like you wanted readers to have a 360 view of creating a family and what would, would end up happening because there were options for them. They could have tried this. They could have done that. And that she's saying, I really want you to have this piece of your country with you. Right. Right. Um, I think I also wanted to portray Remy as more than a two-dimensional, one-dimensional character. He has his prejudices and biases like everybody does. Um, and I, so I have him sort of uh, almost chastising himself by saying, why didn't we adopt a black child? Mm -hmm. You know, what, mm -hmm. what, what is the latent uh, prejudice within me that, that we never really seriously talked about that, you know? Mm -hmm. Uh, because if they had done an adoption in the United States, chances are uh, a black baby or a child is what they would have been uh, offered. And and they don't go that path. Now, Kathy, I believe, does it with the best of intentions. Mm -hmm. uh, she, she genuine, she loves Remy so much. She feels like she understands him so well that she thinks that having a child from India will connect him to his homeland and give him that sense of, you know, fatherhood. Um, the paradox, of course, is Remy secretly, again, jaundiced by his horrible relationship with his mother, wants as little to do with India as possible. Mm -hmm. He even questions at one point whether there'll be any reason for him to keep visiting India once his mother is gone, right? Uh, he he wants distance. And of course, adopting a child from India does exactly the opposite. It it complicates his life. But again, he doesn't have he doesn't have it in him to just turn to his wife and say, no, sweetie, I don't think that's a good idea. Right. You know? Right. Because he is he is that kind of a uh you know, conflicted, uh slightly weak person. Mm-hmm. We definitely see that as time goes on. Like, what is, what's Remy going through? Remy's doing a whole metamorphosis while he's there. And he's remembering his father telling him in a note, because the only way to destroy the museum of failures is to burn every shameful secret that it ever held. And when people read the book, they're going to see the significance of that line, because yeah. you're going to see what unfolds that would make him say, everything's got to come out in order for it to be like, you know, something different yeah. for the failures to go away. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And I love the scene at the end with the kite flying. There's something magical about this scene. I'm not going to give it away, but why kites there? Because the kites to me, were, they they said to me hope. And they also reminded me of the kite runner where they were out and it's something childish that you do. You go yeah. out and fly a kite and automatically yeah. you become like a child again. Right. And it's a chance for Remy to just like let loose and become yeah. a child. Yeah. Well, you've kind of answered your own question, but 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 also but also the sense of freedom, of liberation. You know, yeah. you it's you and the kite under a sky, right. and uh, it's flying, right? right. It's, it's a form of flying. Um, right. So I wanted I wanted the poor guy who I've tortured and <laughs> twisted throughout the book to have some degree of catharsis. You know, at least a moment of genuine transcendence and freedom and fun i just yeah. wanted him to have fun yeah it was great it's a really great scene and it's funny because a lot of this book i see as being um f like film running in my head like i could see the imagery so beautifully done of everything from the, the morning where he goes down to the beach and he just puts his feet in the water there were so many scenes where you got to see the city even though I've never been to India, I felt like I was in that place. I was in what it was like to be in one of those high rise buildings, what it was like for the smells on the streets and whatever. So I, but that scene at the end really, and you know, encapsulated it all to me. It was just like, Oh, I love it. So when you finish writing, who sees your work first? Is it your agent? Is it your editor? Who sees it? Um, 
in the past, it's always been this very dear friend of mine. Um, and she read this, this book too. And um, she actually helped me with this version. As I just mentioned to you, uh, I had a very different draft uh, initially. And right. she talked me through, you know, making it better, basically. So she was the first person who saw it after I implemented some of her suggestions <clears throat> and got done, uh, which, which, you know, I did in a matter of maybe two weeks of that mm -hmm. you know, once she read it. Then I sent it to my agent who gave me pages and pages of notes, something that I've always craved and wanted, you know, right. for my work. And she was just fabulous. Um, one of the things she told me was to elongate um, the ending. You know, mm -hmm. I had I had this tendency as a writer, it drives my readers crazy of just cutting off a book, right? Mm -hmm. And everybody's like, wait, what? I want to know more, <laughs> right? Um, and, and she convinced me that that was not a good thing to do with this particular book and that I should maybe add another chapter. Okay. And that became the chapter that we just talked about. Um, and then, of course, my editor saw it. And honestly, by the time I was done following Gail, my agent's suggestions, the book was in pretty good shape. You yeah. know, so there were no real problems uh, with the editing of it. She's total pro, total pro. And when you sit with a total pro, it's like, wait, how about this? How about that? And taking the time to do that. And before it gets to the editor, because I think that um, I've talked to a number of authors recently and they said, you know, the, the editor gets one good pass at it, like looking at it. And then from there, if there's too much work to be done, it's going to be difficult. It's going to be making all those changes at that point is really, really rough. And they'll pass on it, right? I mean, why shouldn't they? Because they have, you know, there's no dearth of wonderful books being right. written and produced and passing by their desk mm -hmm. every single day, you know? Mm, it's just wonderful. So the title, I take it, was always The Museum of Failures. Am I always. right? Yeah. Always. Okay, so we didn't change yeah. that at all. Yeah. Okay, let's talk about the cover. My, 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 okay, I just was sure that my galley is so beaten up. I was reading it in the pool over vacation. <laughs> I got all my folded down pages, and I think I've told you in it. the past. There's, there's some where the water hit. <laughs> the, 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 That's great. The, 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 we have this thing that, like, um, Polaris, who runs around, and it spits water, and I'm like, great, in the galley, really nice, all those pages. <laughs> but I fold down pages, and I think I've told you this in the past, and I don't say why. And when I go back to, to like prepare for an interview, I just open to that page and say, what was on that page that I cared about? And do I still care about it at this moment to ask a right. question? And it's an interesting way to go through looking at a book. Instead so you don't of, mark it up. No, you just I just go down the page. And and you can normally remember why you well, like I'll just see this and I'll see just book two. I can't really see this book two. I okay. have a question. Why was there book two? Right. I have a question. Is there going to be a book three? On certain pages, there's certain passages that like, okay, at the beginning, I saw the Museum of Failures was coming up a lot. And I kept folding down those pages at the very beginning. So that we're really setting something up there. But gotcha. I don't write down exactly what it is, because I want yeah. to see later on, if it still matters. Yeah, or yeah. like, is it still a question? Or has it so completely been resolved? And or what I know now has completely um, made it not something that's of interest anymore. So right, let me right. see what you do. So I just fold down that's the page. Brilliant. That's a great, I, I do that too. I fold pages, but I usually like pencil in like yeah. I'll put brackets around things. So that's that's a great technique. To and, and then there's that. times where this, on both pages, so you have to do this fancy little thing. You have to do like origami on that page. But <laughs> believe me, I'm standing in the pool I, and people are joking that like, that's really what you did on your vacation. I said, yes, I stood, I put weights on my feet, I exercised and I turned the pages of the book oh, and a lot man. of them have water on it. Wow. But it was wonderful because the one thing that I loved was I could devour a book. Like I can, I can usually read like a book a day, honestly, but it's like right. just sitting in there and getting as, as opposed to reading 20 pages here, 20 pages yeah. there or whatever. Yeah. So I feel like when that's the way many people read, but I feel like to do an interview, you almost have to have that whole breath quickly because right. that's what you're going to get out of speaking with the author as well. So the cover has got, okay, we've got type, we've got flowers what what's what do we have here what's what's going on besides missing flowers and hope um i think there are some thorns too because they're supposed to be roses yes yes and yes. and uh and i i can't let me let me look at my own copy um yes they're thorns yeah they're and you see there, there are thorns thorn going thorn. through yes. the word failure so uh failures um so i think 
it's a pretty uh, well thought out uh, cover. Of course, I can't take the slightest bit of credit for it because <laughs> it's, I had nothing to do with it. Um, but I, and, and the font that they've used, if you recall, Carol, is the same font that they used last year for honor. Honor, yes, and exactly. So, so it gives you that sense of continuity, although, of course, it's different characters, different, it's a different story altogether. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, I think they did a beautiful job, but Algonquin is sort of known for its beautiful jackets anyway, so. Yeah. You know, we want to do an evening with our readers, with a cover designers, a couple of cover designers coming on and talking about yeah. how they do covers, because it's such a big part of what's going to interest you in reading a book when you're in a store, if you have never heard about the book. And to sit and see over, over my vacation, the other thing I did is I went to a local Barnes and Noble. We don't, we have a very small indie bookstore near here, very yeah. tiny, but we went, I went to Barnes and Noble because I've heard they've redone, you know, what's going on. Right. It was really interesting to go in and see a wall of books because so many times when we're looking, we're looking for an image online on a publisher's site, we're looking for an image here or there, but to see the whole wall and see yeah. the way books yeah. come to life. Right. And I feel like, you know, this will stand out and it'll stick out, which is important when you look at that whole wall, you know, right. Right. Yeah. going on. How about the audio? Do you have anything to do with the audio? Yeah, yeah. I actually helped them. They, they gave me a choice of three or four uh, readers. Um, and uh, I loved the guy because who we picked. Um, he had read one of my favorite novels many, many years ago, Royton Mysteries, uh, Fine Balance. He was mm -hmm. the reader for that. He's a voice actor, but I think he's also an actor, actor. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so he did a audition and the snippet that I heard was so fantastic. We were thinking like, how are we gonna do Sharon's voice, right? So will we hire a second female uh, voice actor for that, etc. He read her passages, you know, as part of conversation between her and Remy so effectively he just changed his voice ever so slightly softened it a little bit um that i thought yeah i think he can pull it off i think he can do all the multiple voices in this book mm -hmm. like without it's feeling like you know exaggerated or caricature like he didn't do like some high-pitched voice i mean it was just very tastefully done mm -hmm. i think people who pick up the audio of this are in for a very pleasant surprise because he's oh. terrific Oh, that's terrific as well. So I, and I get to ask you the line that, oh, God, really, Carol, at this moment, are you working on something new? <laughs> <laughs> okay. I mean, this is really great. Honor was terrific. Everything's right. really good, but like, hey, what's next? <laughs> right the whip. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm trying to, it, you know, right now I've taken yeah. a bit of a sabbatical because I'm teaching full time and I'm promoting this book. So okay. it would be a bridge too far, but I think uh, starting next year, uh, I'll be able to devote a lot of time and attention to it. I'm trying to write a kind of mystery novel with a twist mm -hmm. and that's new for me. So it's going to be a steep learning curve, but I'm excited. I know the characters. I know what happens in the book. I have probably over a hundred pages written, which, mm. which will all, you know, end up in the trash can at some point and <laughs> I'll start again. But um, so far, so good. There is momentum. Yeah. yeah, you know, and it's interesting because a lot of books right now, they're big art thrillers and there's that twist or what's going on. And when it's done magically, it's amazing. It's, you know, yeah. it takes you like yeah. to a completely different place. And it's, it's it, interesting, you know, my twist is not going to be like a major plot twist. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just in the character development that I want to try something different than what what has been done. In the yeah. Past. Oh, that sounds great. That's, well, we look forward to it. As Thank we you. have looked forward to every book you've done. So this is like really terrific. Thank you so much for joining us and being a part oh of God. this. We appreciate it. Thank you, Carol. You're just a delight to talk to. You know that.